thank you so much for hanging in there. And like I said, I know it's a dump truck. Uh, for some of you that have been studying eschatology for a while, it's not that new. Uh, but I've been to many prophecy conferences, you know, and there's an assumption people understand all the covenants. There's an assumption people know more of the Old Testament than they do. And so while you may not remember everything we go over, that's the purpose of the notes. And at least you're going to be exposed to all the issues that touch eschatology. Does that make sense? Okay, so bear with the, you know, the dump truck. <laughs> um, you know, later on, we could have a conference, you know, like a whole weekend on just one facet. But right now, I'm trying to put it all together too. And specifically, so we as a church know why we believe what we do concerning the millennium. That's really where I'm going, okay? So right now I'm supposed to be doing Daniel, but we have to look, we're a little bit behind, we have to look at the new covenant, okay? So uh, one of the most famous passages for the new covenant is found in Jeremiah chapter 31, but back up a little bit to chapter 23, and we read, or 24, we read this, and remember Jeremiah is a prophet saying to Israel, to Jerusalem, you're going down. You're going into captivity. Remember, that's the context. They're bad people. They've forsaken the Lord, broken his covenant. All right? But after all of that doom, the prophet says this. God says, I will set my eyes on them for good. Really? Why? The Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant. Um, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up, not overthrow them. I will plant them. I will not uproot them. How much clearer can it get? It's not talking about the church. This has no application historically to the people of God today. All right. And I will give them a new heart to know me. So the new covenant concept is not just Jeremiah 31. It's really all over the Old Testament. Remember back in Deuteronomy? You're going to serve me. You're going to come back to me. Why do they do that? Because of the God's going to convert them. So I am the Lord. They will be my people. I will be their God, for they will return to me wholeheartedly. Has that ever happened in Jewish history? No. When the Jews came back from Babylon, you would think they would have learned a lesson. Do you know they got worse? Read Nehemiah. He was pulling their hair out, literally. The end of Nehemiah says, I pulled their hair out. They were so bad. And the priests in Malachi, they were called trippers because they caused people to trip over the law. You make my people stumble in the way. And did they wholeheartedly re receive Jesus? No. So this has not been fulfilled in the Babylonian return. It was not fulfilled when Jesus came. It just ain't been fulfilled. Bad English, good Greek or Hebrew. All right? So, I mean, these are God's words. This is promise to these people. So we get to the famous passage, Jeremiah 31, 31, and following. Behold, the days are coming. Do you see the prophetic wink? Huh? Days are coming. In that day, in those days. Uh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of the church. Did I read that right? No. It's delivered to them as a nation. And not like the covenant I made with their fathers when I took them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, that would be the Mosaic covenant. They broke it. Okay? But this is the covenant which I will make with them, will, future, future, in that day, with who? 
Who, who gets the new covenant? The house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them and on their heart. I will write it. They will, I will be their God. They'll be my people. You don't need to teach them anymore because they're going to know me. Look at the end of the verse uh, 34. This is the big deal. This is what the new covenant is all about. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. This is tissue time. Not one box of tissues or Kleenex, but two. When he keeps his covenant with his people, you can't help but think about a day when Israel saved. Okay? Oh, man. When they know their Messiah. So the new covenant, it includes land. It includes a lot of things. But the big deal about the new covenant, which none of the others could do, I'll forgive your sin. And we are only here because our sins are forgiven. And Israel will only get the land when her sins are forgiven. Oh, they're in it now. But it's anything but the holy land if you've been to Israel. Okay, it's a pretty wicked country, actually. Shine the ray rainbow flag on the wall. Do you know that? In Israel. So, thus says the Lord, continuing this great promise of the new covenant, who gives the light in the moon? <laughs> there it is. As long as creation is like it is, he's not going to revert on this covenant. If the fixed order of the moon and the stars and the sea removes from before me, then the offspring of Israel will cease. When will there not be a nation Israel? When there's no more moon and stars and sea. This is a pretty serious covenant. And you can't, I don't think, you can't go, well, this now applies to the church. I don't, I don't think that it's done. I just don't, I can't do it. Okay, look at this. The days are coming, down in verse 38, declares the Lord, when the city will be rebuilt. And it gives the geographical de <laughs> descriptions from this tower to that tower, from this hill to that hill. We see it in other places in the Old Testament. You have literal land and city descriptions. That hasn't happened. And the whole valley of the dead bodies, you know, it's full of ashes. You know, it's all going to be cleaned up and it's going to be holy to the Lord. There's going to be a day when Jerusalem is holy to the Lord. Now, I can tell you exactly when this day will be. I got a secret insight. Look, turn in your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. Zechariah 12.10. And this is really the Kleenex box here. I mean, this is. Um, I, I think many of you might have, uh, have memorized this passage. So this is after the first few verses in the chapter of Zechariah. I'm going to bring all the nations against Jerusalem. By the way, this hadn't happened yet. Okay. And Jerusalem will be a very troublesome cup to all the nations. In other words, it's going to be on CNN all the time because it's a real burden to the world. <laughs> that little old country is always in the news. All right? But the Lord's going to save them. He'll save Judah. He'll save uh, Jerusalem. And... Verse 9, it will be in the day, in that day, there it is again, in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that came against the church. No, but that's what, that's what the reform commentary says. Jerusalem's the church. This is the Reformation commentary. Just came out not too long ago. This is talking about all the people that oppose the church. 
You can't do that, brothers. That's really, and sisters, that's a bad hermeneutics. Okay? So here's the day that Israel gets saved. When God delivers them from the nations, verse 10, and I will pour out on the house of David. Again, you have David, Jacob, Zion, Judah, Jerusalem, my people. This is not the church. The inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the, I will pour out on them the spirit of grace and supplication, and they will look on me whom they pierced. When it happens someday in the future, when all the nations are against Israel, and it looks like they're going to be destroyed, boom, Jesus comes, stands on the Mount of Olives, and he gives them the new covenant. How else are they going to cry out in repentance, spirit of supplication? Because they get the new covenant. So when Paul says all Israel will be saved, this is the very day. The very day when it looks like they're going to go under, he pops through the clouds, stands on the Mount of Olives, it splits, and they go, oh, it, <laughs> he was the Messiah. We missed it. Oh, God, forgive us. Then they get the kingdom. Because salvation is of the Lord. I mean, that is some good stuff. You talk about when that happens, all the nations will know who Yahweh is. I guarantee double dog to you they will. Okay? That's Aramaic. <laughs> <laughs> so it's actually a good thing. Okay. Turn on over to chapter 14. <laughs> we'll never get done. <laughs> These things come to my head. And by the way, the more of the prophets you get into your head, you begin to put these pieces together. Okay? Uh, it's just the way it is. Okay? Because you, you see there's a lot of pieces here. Look at Zechariah 14. It starts the same way. All the nations will be against Jerusalem. Chapter 12 and 14 are identical time periods. In that day, all the nations against Jerusalem, and they will be saved. And uh, look at this. Um, the Lord stands on the Mount of Olives, and they will flee. And then look at verse 6. It shall come to pass in that day, so you have the Lord coming, the mountain splitting, the remnant being saved. He destroys the nations. You put chapter 12 and 14 together, same time period. In that day, it will come to pass. In that day, there will be no light. This is a unique day. The lights will diminish. It shall be one day, which is known only to the Lord, neither by day or night. In the evening time it will happen that it will be light. In that day, there will be living waters flowing from Jerusalem. What just happened? The kingdom. Now you've got a river flowing from Jerusalem, a real one. It's not the church. A real one. Half of them to the eastern sea, that's the Dead Sea. Half of them to the western, that's the Mediterranean. You see, you've got real geography here. You have to deal with that in the summer and the winter. So, here is something else you need to know when you're reading prophecy, especially the prophets, you know, the major and minor prophets. They, they talk like this, doom, reward, judgment, mercy. It's the pattern throughout the Old Testament. I'm going to get you, I'm going to restore you. I'm going to get you, I'm going to restore you. Why, brothers and sisters, are they written that way? That is the pattern, I promise you. Because God's keeping his covenant. I'm going to get you. Oh, wait a minute. I'm going to restore you. Oh, I'm going to bring the nations against you, and it's going to look like you're going to go under for sure. <gasps> but on that day, you get the kingdom. I'll be in Jerusalem, in my temple. Water's flowing from the temple to the Mediterranean and the Dead Sea. I take it literally. I, I cannot understand how else to take it. I really can't. I've tried. Okay, so new covenant includes this day when Israel saved, when she gets her new heart. All right? 
and it comes with material blessings as well. Is, are, are you okay? I didn't say do you agree, but do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. Behold, I'm going to gather them from all the lands. See, this is so repetitive. I'm bringing them back from everywhere. Remember Ezekiel's dry bones? I'm going to bring them all back with bones and put flesh on them. But then one day I'll put the spirit in them. That's the same thing. That's when they're saved. Okay? I will give them a new heart, and they will fear me always. An everlasting covenant, I will put the fear of God in them, <laughs> the fear of me in them, and they will not turn away from me. I will plant them in this land. If they get one, they get them both. If they get a new heart, they get the land. All right? I'm not talking about the church in heaven. So the covenant elves would say, oh, we get a new heart, and you don't really need the land anymore because heaven's better. That's called expansion theology, right? I promised you a bike, but I give you a Rolls Royce. What's the difference? You know, didn't I keep my promise? So, uh, so I, I don't think we can do that. Look at Ezekiel 16. Uh, some of these chapters in Ezekiel, man, he really comes down on them. This is a long chapter in Ezekiel. He found them in their afterbirth, laying in a ditch, and he nursed the nation. It's an incredible love story. And he marries her, and she departs from him and plays the harlot. And the end of the chapter, guess what happens? I will remember my covenant with you. But what's the name of our church? What's the first word? What do you think that is? That's grace, unbelievable grace. Believable <laughs> by the Spirit, right? Then you will remember your ways and you'll be ashamed. So I will establish my covenant with you. This is a new covenant and you shall know the Lord when I have forgiven you for all you have done. This preaches, man. <laughs> it's a gospel for Israel okay for Israel Ezekiel 20 I will make you pass under the rod you know the shepherd's there and he's watching the sheep go through he puts the rod down nope no good you can go you can't you can't because he's going to refine Israel so when she goes into the kingdom it's all believers. I will bring you into the bond of the covenant and purge you from all the revels and bring you out of the land where they reside, but they will not enter the land of Israel. So you will know I'm the Lord. So in this last day, he's purging Israel. So only the believers get into the land and into the kingdom. Okay? It's part of the covenant. Ezekiel 36, I will sprinkle clean water on you. This is the whole idea of this forgiveness, right? And you will be clean. I will cleanse you from your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. Remove the heart of stone and flesh. Who's this for? Who's it written to? It's written to Israel. Jacob, Zion, Jerusalem. I mean, this, this is really good. Don't you wish the whole place was full of Jews here in this? Huh? Ezekiel 37. They will live on the land that I gave to Jacob. See, if it was just Abraham in a few places, you might could say it, these promises go to the church. But you have Abraham, Jacob, Zion, Jerusalem, the covenant I made with Isaac and, and Judah. And, you know, it's too specific. It's just too specific. And I will make a covenant of peace. So the new covenant is an everlasting covenant. It's a covenant of peace. It's an everlasting covenant. And my dwelling and my sanctuary will be in your midst forever. You remember we read, he will build the temple. Where is he going to build it? In Jerusalem, the Messiah is going to dwell with them. He's going to be their king and their priest. This is prophecy. <laughs> it don't get no gooder. Just making sure you're awake. 
My dwelling will be with you. The nations will know that I am the Lord. See, it is so many times when Israel saved, that's when the nations know who Yahweh is. Do the nations know who Yahweh is yet? I don't think so. Not like this. By the way, buy stock in El Al Airlines because in the millennium, everybody's going to Jerusalem. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> when, <laughs> when my sanctuary is in their midst. Okay. I don't think it's been fulfilled in the church. That's, that's my point here. I will make a covenant. This is Hosea. With them, with the animals of the field. I mean, the land's going to change. The livestock's going to change. It's all part of the new covenant. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me. Can you see the Lord waiting for the salvation of Israel? I mean, we're his bride, but so is Israel. You ever read, remember that song we used to sing in the old days, Beulah Land, I'm dwelling in Beulah Land. If you're young, you don't remember that one. Well, Beulah is the Hebrew word for married. It comes from Isaiah. Jehovah is married to the land. And he's going to put this betrothed people on the land. Someday. Okay. I will restore the people. This is Zephaniah. I'll give them pure lips, and they, they will call upon the name of the Lord. I'll bring them from Ethiopia. On that day, I, you will feel no shame because of all your deeds when you rebelled against me. You see the conversion there? This is new covenant stuff. Forgiveness, conversion, restoration, physically and spiritually. It's promised to the house of Israel. And there's the 1210. I forgot I had it up there. We just read, right? On that day when I split the sky and stand on the Mount of Olives, I'll give Israel a new heart, and they will look on me whom they pierced. A spirit of supplication is a conversion that causes you to repent. Okay? So, Malachi, Jesus is the messenger of the covenant. Not only is he the covenant, but he's the messenger of the covenant. He ratifies the new covenant. He's the one that makes it happen because he is the great high priest. He's the sacrificial lamb, the lamb without spot. We all know that because we're Christians, right? He, he is the covenant and he ratifies the covenant, which is really forgiveness really forgiveness okay now where do we fit in here are we members of the new covenant are we members of the new covenant yeah uh -uh. <laughs> do we participate in the new covenant praise god, yes. praise god yeah really did you get the land this is where we need to be a little bit careful. Now, when Jesus came, did he claim to be the new covenant? This is the new covenant in my blood. When we say amen, and when we believe in him, drink him, eat him, which means believe and trust in him, do we get this new covenant blessing? Absolutely. We get the forgiveness of sin. So, Sometimes we battle on what word to use. Do we participate in the new covenant? I don't even think we do that. It's for Israel. Okay? Are we identified with the Messiah? Yes. So we get the spiritual promise of forgiveness that comes through the new covenant. We are attached to the covenant himself. But we don't get the land. We don't get all the other things. So we are identified with the covenant himself. We have forgiveness because we believe in him and his work on the cross. So, yes, we participate in the new covenant in the sense that we've been forgiven by Israel's Messiah. Okay? That's the only way any of us are going to be forgiven is through Israel's Messiah. Right? And what he did on the cross. 
So when we take the cup, this is the new covenant, we're remembering what Jesus did because he himself is the covenant. But are we participating in the new covenant promise to Israel? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so. There's a little wiggle room. You know, what word to use? Do we participate in it? No, I, I, I don't think so. I think we are just like the text is going to say here in Ephesians 2, 2 through 13. You Gentiles were formerly strangers to the covenants of Israel. Remember, we studied about the covenants, right? Having no hope, but now Christ Jesus, who formerly, you know, you were far off, you have been brought where? Near. We've been brought near to the covenant keeper, the covenant giver, the covenant himself, Jesus Christ through faith. You can't nullify the new covenant for Israel. That's still going to happen. But aren't you happy we've been brought near to Israel's covenant? Especially getting forgiveness through her Messiah? Christianity is the expansion of Judaism in the right way, <laughs> right? We're trusting in the Jewish Messiah. A partial hardening has happened to who? Israel. Do you remember yesterday? The kingdom is near. The kingdom is near. They rejected him. What, what did Jesus say? It's not near anymore. It's going to be near in the future. This is it. A hardening has happened to Israel. By the way, Israel is not the church here. How can you have a hardening to the church? So even today, there's a distinction between a Jew and a Gentile. I mean, Israel and Gentile. There's still a distinction, even though we're one people of God. There's a distinction between Jews and Gentiles. There's a partial hardening to Israel now. The remnants, few, right? Few Jews believe. But... Uh, uh, until the fullness of the Gentiles, all of us who will be saved and put into the Christ body, then Israel will be saved. Then how much of Israel? All Israel. See, you can't make this work if you think this means the church, because all the church is always saved. <laughs> you can't have a partial hardening in the church. So there's a distinction. Israel today, Jews and over in the land of Israel, there's a partial hardening. They're hostile to the gospel. But when the church is complete and all the Gentiles are saved, this is that mystery. We're in that gap. We're in that period where God was working with the Jews primarily. Now he's primarily working with Gentiles. He's saving us, putting us into the Messiah's body, the church. Until all that's finished, then Israel will be saved. Now, you put the pieces together, when will they be saved? When Jesus comes and stands on the Mount of Olives and they look upon him and they pierced. Until then, there's the church. Then Israel will be saved. <sighs> Do you see this? Yes, no, I didn't say agree. Do you see what I... I think the Bible's clear about. Yes. Um, it, it might be a long question. Could I save it? Save it. Well, that's coming. We are the the spiritual blessing of forgiveness that comes in the promise to Israel, her new covenant. That forgiveness has been extended to us unworthy Gentiles. And we can be forgiven by faith in the Jewish Messiah. That's, that's amazing. It's amazing grace. So part of the point I'm making here is that new covenant has not been put aside for Israel. She's going to get it according to all those promises. She's going to get it. Are we New Covenant people? Yes, because we believe in the Jewish New Covenant. 
<laughs> in that sense, we're identified with them. We're participating in the new covenant because we get the Messiah's forgiveness. I think sometimes we're removed from all the Old Testament promises so much. Yeah. Yeah. We are. Israel's the bride of Jehovah. Yeah, Jehovah said, Yahweh said, I'm going to betroth them. And he will. And he will. Right now, we are the bride of Christ. We are this body of the Messiah Christ. But one day, Israel's going to be the bride of God. That's what the text says. what the text says when she's saved so in the new eternal state everybody will be the bride of god and christ in the eternal state but for now there are distinctions okay i mean you know, you can go to prophecy conferences and learn about the mark of the beast and the rapture and all that, but really, very few people dig down to the deep foundation of all of prophecy, and that's what we're trying to do today. So, any elders, am I misspeaking in any way? You know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, you know, the way you describe our relationship to the Jewish New Covenant. It can be tricky, but hey, the bottom line is we're forgiven because we trust in him, and he is the new covenant. And by the way, that is a fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise. In Abraham, we're blessed. We are the seed, small seed of Abraham, because we believe in the big seed, seed of Abraham. And one day, the small seed of Abraham, the Jews, will be saved too. Okay? Okay. So we're descendants of Abraham in a spiritual sense because we, we, uh, we um, exercise faith like he did. So he's an example. He's a father to all who believe. By the way, that was said, Abraham, that was said before he was a Jew, <laughs> before there were covenants with Israel. Everybody who believes is like, a, or is like Abraham who believed. But that does not nullify this physical seed of Abraham receiving all these promises. So seed can be used in more than one sense. Messiah, spiritual descendants, and physical descendants. So ha have you, you see how all this leads up to the new covenant? How is Israel going to get the kingdom? Are they going to work hard enough for it? No. God's going to refine them. Does that remind you of any time period? When would God, when do you think God might refine Israel? Tribulation, which is what we're going to study after our next break. Yeah. He's going to refine them, put them through the fire, all the nations against Israel, the book of Revelation. Daniel's 70th week, and in the end, he'll save them because he's gracious, okay? He's going to deal with sin because he's holy, but he's going to save them because he's righteous and keeps his covenant. In the meantime, we get to believe in the Jewish Messiah, and he's written us letters too, the, the New Testament, okay? Is that right, Brother Bob? <laughs> yeah so it is it is easy as a new christian and growing up you don't really dig deep and and you go yeah yeah well, you know i got the new covenant well you have the blessings of forgiveness that comes with the new covenant but that ain't all of it because it included land and it was really for israel and because they've been set aside and hardened for a period of time, now the emphasis is on us Ninevites. We get to believe. And the gospel of the Jewish Messiah has gone to us. 
and to all the nations with a future still left for Israel. Does that make sense? So we're in this church period until God begins to deal with Israel again. Yes. Taking what away? Taking some of the excitement, some of the climax away. But I'll, I'll, I just wanted to say that, like you would say, it's, it's so great, but it gets gooder. It gets gooder, but yeah. It's not, but it's not that we're trying to downplay anything that's happening right now. You mean downplay our relationship with the right. Messiah now? No, of course we don't downplay it. It's, For clarification. Yeah. Do you, uh, so what Steve was saying was, Sometimes we look at this and go, oh, you just kind of took it down a notch, you know, me being part of Christ in the new covenant. No, 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 not at all. It's an incredible grace that the new covenant promise to Israel is extended to us, the forgiveness part. That's incredible grace. I mean, when we sing and worship, who are we worshiping? The Jewish Messiah, the Jewish King. I mean, it's for me, you know, we have to go by what the Bible says, but I'll get emotional here on you. So this part does not really matter. It's just my emotion. But I get excited to think about ruling and reigning with this Jewish Messiah, who is my Lord and the Lord of all. It's a whole great thing. Their Messiah has forgiven me. So the gospel, it went to the Jews, right? Paul went to the synagogues. He was quoting these kingdom passages, by the way, even in the book of Acts. When he's preaching to Israel, he's quoting these kingdom pr promises. Okay? So I think in the right perspective, it's even, it's greater. It's not, for me, the other view is more of a downplay. Oh, we're just part of this spiritual church and you and it, and, it, and it negates all of the blessings the land promises and everything else that i think are still future okay so I, I in my mind in my mind i can see and i've been to israel and watched those jews bow you know and bob against the wall and they don't know christ can't you see the day when they know christ incredible and they become the kingdom of priests they were intended to be and the knowledge of the lord is going throughout the earth I, that's incredible that is good prophecy that is really good prophecy okay any questions so when you take communion, we're remembering the Jewish Messiah who died for us. Not just Israel, he died for all who believe, right? But remember, when did he say he would drink it again? In the kingdom. Yeah. That's what I meant. Am I wrong about that? No, you're not wrong. Okay. So uh, Haley was saying this. Do we participate at all in the land? Yes, we do. When we are taken to heaven and glorified, we come back with Christ. And we rule over this kingdom. So we are going to be co-heirs of this earthly kingdom with Christ. He'll be sitting on the throne and we will be his servants during this thousand years. Can you imagine ruling and reigning with Christ? That's incredible. How that works out, I'll show you tomorrow. What it looks like to reign in the kingdom. Okay? So, uh, yeah, 
it's gooder. It's gooder. Now, this is our view as a church, I think, right? Elders, this is pretty much our view. And if we're wrong, okay, you know, I'm going to be really sorry. Uh, one time somebody asked MacArthur, it was a Q&A session, if you're wrong about the millennium, what are you going to tell Jesus when you get to heaven? You remember his answer? He said, I'm just going to say I believe what you wrote. <laughs> I mean, he wrote this, right? God wrote this. Christ wrote this. The Spirit inspired it. The prophets penned it that there's a coming kingdom for Israel and they'll be saved. Okay. Any other uh, questions, tomatoes, remarks? You'll have to chew on it and talk to the elders, talk to other people, you know, to get all the finer nuances. But you've been exposed to the foundation of biblical prophecy. Yeah. Okay, the, the uh, question is, what, is what do we do with the, the idea of adoption? Are we adopted into God's family? The text says we are. Okay, but are we adopted into Israel? I don't think so. Remember, there's a discontinuity. Those are, those are two big words, continuity and discontinuity. You have to know those words. Continuity means... There's a lot of similarity between the church and Israel. Discontinuity means there's differences between the church and Israel. So yes, we are the family of God. We are the body of Christ. We've been adopted into God's family, to Christ's family. Absolutely. That's a whole other metaphor, talking about our relationship to the Jewish Messiah. So Yeah, we, we inherit the kingdom in the sense we're rulers. Because at the end of this time, at the end of this time, when God purges Israel and saves them, that's a physical nation, correct? I mean, that's what I think. So this physical nation goes into the kingdom. But we're there too. Because we're part of God's family, we're sons, and we rule and reign with him. So it's a both and. We're in the kingdom with our glorified bodies, ruling and reigning over a physical earth. Did I answer it? Hang in there. You're saying, how can those two things be going on at the same time? Uh, glorified bodies mixing with uh, a physical world in the kingdom, okay? Uh, Jesus did it. Yeah, he came back with his glorified body, remember? Yes. So, will Israel rule and reign with Christ, or will we rule and reign with Israel will be the head of the nations. We will be ruling and reigning with Christ. I will make you the head of the nations with Christ's throne there. Now, here's what happens. It's inevitable. And, and no matter what side you're on, we all do it. But I don't understand how that can work. How can there be physical people and glorified people in the same kingdom? We have some hints. Uh... Let me give you one, and then we'll take a break. I'll give you a hint. Go to uh, Zechariah 14 also. This is just fresh on my mind. There's a lots of ways we could rule and reign with Christ. So... 
Israel repents, and uh, in verse 10 of chapter 14, you have changes in the topography. You see that? The land will be turned from, you know, to a plain. So you got mountains going down and a plain appearing. I, I, it's just literal because it even gives the sights. Jerusalem shall be raised up, and it gives all from this gate to that gate. If it's not literal, you wouldn't have these exact gates and dimensions. It wouldn't serve a purpose. And the people will dwell in it. There will no longer be uh, utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited in a physical city. And it shall be the plague with which the Lord shall strike the people who fought against Jerusalem. In other words, he won. The enemies have been defeated. Now they're enjoying the city. Uh, that's an interesting verse. Their flesh will rot in, in, <laughs> and their eye sockets will rot while they're standing up. Sounds like a nuclear bomb, but it's pretty much Christ burning a hole in them. It shall come to pass in that great day there'll be great panic. So you have back and forth, right? I'm going to save you. You're going to get the kingdom. I'm, I'm going to destroy the nations. And... Uh, and all those who came against you, verse 16, it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of the nations which come against Jerusalem shall go up year to year to worship the king. So whoever goes into the kingdom, every year they go to Jerusalem. This is the kingdom. All right? And to worship the Lord of hosts. So this is literal people in a literal kingdom going every year to worship the, the king. And it shall be that whoever of the families of the earth do not come to Jerusalem to worship, even if it's the family of Egypt, they shall receive the plague which the Lord will strike the nations who do not come, against, come up to the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths. You see that? So you've got festivals. You've got days of worship. And there's a requirement for heads of the households and leaders of nations to go to Jerusalem every year to worship. If they don't come, guess what happens? Their punishment will be <clears throat> in that day. Uh, wait a minute. Where does it say the rain? Huh? Oh, I skipped right over it. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, they shall, uh, there will be no rain. So if you don't go to Israel to worship in the kingdom, drought. So that's what the text says. I believe it. Okay, now I step over here into step, speculation, okay? So you don't have to believe this. <laughs> Thus says the Lord, if you don't go to Jerusalem, you won't get rain in the kingdom. Here's Ken's speculation. Uh, Bob, you rule Sefner. So Bob goes to Jerusalem one day. He says, Lord, the Sephonites didn't go to Jerusalem this year. Of course, the Lord knows. But he'll say, Bob, go stop the rain. That's an idea of how you can rule and reign with Christ. That's speculation, okay? I admit it. But we're instruments of rule. And remember, one of the promises to us, overcomers, is ruling and reigning. And if you're, over, if you're faithful with a little here, you're going to be given a lot then. So maybe somebody in here who's faithful will be over Florida. <laughs> so in some way, we will be, like angels do now, serving the Lord in his kingdom. Okay? That'd be cool. There's other instances like that, but that's an example. So again, the more you're familiar, and this happens every, this is like a class, I understand. But in every class, inevitably, the students say, I just did not know my prophets. I did not know the prophets. So when you start seeing this, it really starts getting pretty, pretty detailed. It gets harder and harder to swipe the spiritual brush over it. Okay. Uh, 